From the WKYT studios in Lexington, this is Kentucky Newsmakers with Bill Bryant. Hello from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant, hoping that you're enjoying your weekend. This evening at 6, the League of Women Voters, WKYT and WLKY in Louisville, will present the major party candidates for governor in a debate. It'll be live from Eastern Kentucky University. Again, that is coming up at 6 o'clock this evening. Independent Drew Curtis is a legally qualified candidate as well, but he fell short of the league's criteria for getting in in that debate. That included showing up with a 10% support level in a nonpartisan statewide poll. Over the last two weeks, we have interviewed Republican candidate Matt Bevan and Democratic candidate Jack Conway. Today, we talk with Curtis about his campaign and how it's been tough as an independent to get attention. For those who have followed his campaign, it's uh, difficult to put any kind of label on Curtis. He's an internet entrepreneur who runs the humorous website FARC.com. He also holds an MBA from Columbia University, but he grew up up here in Lexington. His views are not predictable, and just when you put him in a slot, he surprises you with a stand that may seem to come from the other direction. Independent candidate for governor Drew Curtis is with us today. We appreciate you coming in. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having here. me. I appreciate it. Well, at this point, uh, shut out of the debates uh, without uh, substantial money, it would appear, to mount uh, a last minute uh, on air campaign. Um, is this now about winning or giving the people the opportunity to, uh, to protest? Yeah, so it is still about winning. Uh, this was never about uh, being the protest vote. I mean, I'll take it. Don't get me wrong. But no, uh, so I have a theory about how this is all going to play out. And now we're going to find out if I'm right. That only applies in the last two weeks, which is this is now the time when people wake up and they go, OK, who's actually running for office? Um, and in fact, I don't believe most people are going to look into that until probably November 2nd, uh, the day before the election. And then here's the question. What do they like what they see? Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to check their party candidate out, not be particularly excited, check the other party's candidate out, not be particularly excited, and they're going to take a look at me expecting nothing and find, oh, wait, there's actually a viable guy over here. And the question becomes, what happens then? And I actually don't know. I couldn't predict the outcome. Do you think it's a, a reasonable uh, path to victory, though, for you, if, particularly if we now know there are some uh, new ads coming in from both sides? Most of those are critical of each other. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, see that uh, potential for coming up the middle between two candidates who are fighting and that turns people off? Absolutely. In fact, this was always the only way I was ever going to win this, was, you know, capitalizing on the fact that, you know, more or less, those of us who are casual voters who don't pay much attention to this process, we don't like it. We don't like it when candidates, you know, uh, are in debates and they get a question and they go on for 90 seconds about something unrelated just to kill time. You know, uh, I've been uh, practicing saying, I don't know, but I'll look into it whenever I get a question like that, because that's what we would rather hear rather than, you know, essentially a lie. And nobody likes this process. And again, like I said, so the question becomes, when casual voters activate, what are they going to do when they see what they've got? And in particular, uh, with more money coming in for more negative advertising, this, the advertising we all don't like, and candidates not wanting to talk about particular issues, again, you know, what, what's going to happen? I offer a viable alternative. And so this is a chance for Kentuckians to go, you know, all right, you know, yeah, we don't like the way this has always gone. Let's do something different. Having this uh, incredible seat uh, in history that you really have had, here and this opportunity to watch those major party candidates operate. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, uh, why do you think they have difficulty saying, I don't know, or uh, feel the need to cling to a position that they may in reality feel that, uh, it, you know, they need to be moving uh, maybe in another direction? Yeah, so I actually, uh, about a year ago, I couldn't have answered this question, but I looked into it because the first thing I did when I decided to run was look at how is this supposed to work? And so if you have a normal two candidate race, Democrats and Republicans, essentially both of them started 40% on day one. And then in the middle, you have undecideds and don't cares. And you have to do anything you possibly can to get as many of those as possible. And some of these people uh, vote the way that they pick horses at Keeneland. They go, oh, I like the blue one, or the number seven's my lucky number. Uh, so they're trying basically to do that, while at the same time not accidentally triggering anything in uh, voters that would make them go, ah, you know what, I'm not going to look at that guy because his favorite color is red, for example. Um, so I think that's why they do it like that, because they, they don't have to be clever or elegant. They can just basically do the same things they've always done because they start at 40%. Tell us what you bring to the table if uh, people uh, do uh, 
choose to go another direction to, uh, besides these uh, major party nominees? Yeah, so I, I took a look at the process, and this is actually the reason I'm in the race at all, is because if you look at what happens with party candidates, either party, their primary goal is maintain power for the party. Secondary goal is make people rich, who are their friends, and then occasionally they get around to fixing societal problems. I don't like the fact that that's the third priority. And so what you get with me is making that priority the first priority, actually fixing things by being very careful and smart about how we go about doing it. And the second thing that I bring to the table is I am a technologist. I'm a computer programmer. I understand 21st century technology at a level that these other two guys don't. And there are algorithms and systems and broadband networks and things that have been commonplace technology now for 25 years that could make government work a lot better for not that much money and make all of our lives better. And I'd I'd like to bring that to the table and see, you know, can we actually go through and upgrade Kentucky? You know, they've been saying that one candidate wants to keep us in the 19th century. I would argue the other wants us in the 20th. It's the 21st century. Let's get going. Well, you here you are uh, with people trying to find some label to pin on you, uh, and you will, you know, you'll take positions that some see as conservative. You'll take others that some see as liberal and uh, libertarian. Uh, is it that you are? all over the board or is it that you uh, just simply respond to uh, the issue each issue as it is and 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 and, and don't try to conform to any kind of uh Ideology. Yeah, I have a different ranking system because the problem with ideology is is that it is the case implementation matters more than ideology. So, for example, like charter schools or right to work, it isn't that all charter schools are bad. It isn't that all right to work proposals might not work either. But the question is, well, how are you going to do it? Because you could implement these things in a way that is extremely destructive if you're not careful. And I'm not saying that I'm for or against it, but what I am in favor of, bring me the implementation that doesn't cause damage, that costs the least amount of money. So I want to see efficient, and I want to see cheap. And anything up in that corner right there is where we're going to start, and we're going to move down from there, and, and that would be the way that I would think an ideal government would run. When you got into this race, did you have any idea uh, the, the steep climb that an independent candidate would have up against the major party candidates? Did you know that the, that the hurdles would be so high uh, for an independent? You know, actually, one of the things that did surprise me was I thought most people were like me, where you go to the polls and you just evaluate the candidates. I didn't realize that so many people not only have sort of like you know, stuck their tribal identity to one of these parties, which, by the way, you're being abused if you have a party identity. They're not; they're taking advantage of your vote. But I was surprised that so Follow many people. Follow up on that. What do you mean? Well, so basically, it's like you know, uh, so tribes are basically like think sports teams, for example. You know, it's like I, I find it strange that people, for example, could be baseball fans of teams because the people on the on the teams move around. So so much. It's like, you know, you're really just a fan of the logo. And that's essentially the same thing in politics is, is that we have a process that produces very transparent candidates that don't really think outside the box too much. And it seems odd to me that we would still be fans of parties that have created a system that benefits the party and not society. It doesn't seem like it's the way to go. Uh, what do you have to say about the rules that have, uh, have, you know, you had to have many more signatures to get on the ballot right. than, uh, than a party candidate did? You have been kept out of uh, some of these uh, uh, debates because you didn't reach a certain level in uh, some of the polling. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate because, like, in order to get ballot eligible as an independent, you need 5,000 signatures. But as a, as a party guy, you need two. Um, that right there, uh, I, I get it. You don't want to have 20 people on the ballot, probably. I think 5,000 is a bit much. I might back that down, but that's, that's not going to happen because the parties like their monopoly. They like the fact that they get to control the discussion, and people like me can't easily jump into the discussion and, and lock people out because the problem with the debate criteria was is that you needed X, X percent of uh, polling in order to qualify. So I did qualify for the first two debates on the basis of that. Uh, but the problem was is that some of these criteria, like 15 percent, by August 24th is quite frankly impossible to hit. And the other problem was is that some of these criteria are more or less arbitrary. Like the KET debate, for example, was 10% in a poll by October 9th. Well, October 16th, one dropped that had me at 11. And it seems like, so I guess we guess it's too late. Like, there's still a week to go, right? So the problem is, is that I, I get that they, they don't want people yelling at them and, you know, accusing them of being unfair. And we don't want to have necessarily anybody jumping in. But it doesn't seem like it's that hard to include at least one other person who, by the way, has been the only person talking about actual problems and actual solutions the entire way. And in fact, I've actually been able to control the entire discussion of this, this political process because I'm the only one bringing actual ideas. Uh, do you think the other candidates have uh, appreciated you being there or they uh, don't want you there with them on stage? I, so I think from a strategic 
strategic level, it doesn't help them if I'm there because all I can do is siphon votes off of both of them, so I don't think they like that. On a personal level, I think they do appreciate me being there just because uh, the other two guys really don't like each other, and it gets kind of testy up there. But then with me sort of moderating the process, like I get along more or less reasonably well with both of them. There's no ill will between me and the other two guys, and I think that helps sort of like lower the, the, uh, the, the aggressiveness that would otherwise be there. Getting to know you over these uh, months and in the years before that, when we would sometimes uh, do some stories on your website, FARC.com and so forth, uh, you seem to enjoy learning and mm -hmm. you realize that you learn more by making mistakes yes. than you do by doing the correct thing maybe sometimes. Correct. As you have made mistakes along the way, mm -hmm. what have you learned? Uh, so it's actually been interesting. Like some of the things that I thought were going to be difficult or not, and other things that I thought were going to be easy were were harder. So like um, as far as mistakes go, I found out uh, if you're an independent candidate and they ask you who you think you might vote for in an election, don't answer that. And you said Trump. I did. And you know what? The problem with the Trump thing is is that uh, he's both fascinating and repulsive simultaneously. And that's the part that I wasn't able to get out was is that you know this is a guy who absolutely is unfit for office without a doubt. He's racist and misogynistic. But the thing that he brought initially was fascinating to me, which was basically just blowing holes right up the middle and not, not conforming to people's ideas. But the problem was he's become kind of a one-trick pony, like a shock radio jock. You know, he's just going for the easy, low-hanging fruit over and over again. And so, unfortunately, the lesson there, is, it got lost, rightfully so. That's a, that was a big mistake. I sh Plus, as an independent, I can't vote in the primary anyway, so it doesn't even make sense to answer that question. And you'll notice, by the way, too, um, so one of my ideas was is I will answer every single question. But in that, when that question was asked, the Democrat refused to answer it. And no, no, real, no real downside to that, as it turns out. So that might be the case that it's like, well, that's a novice mistake. I think, you know, from now on, maybe I might dodge that question. But if you get uh, politically savvy, then do you lose your appeal? Well, it depends. Like, I think <laughs> that one's okay. The thing we don't like dodging is, how would you fix the pension system? How would you do tax reform? And then they go, oh, tax reform's a great idea. Let me talk about something else for 85 seconds. All right. So that's you, what we don't like. You brought up a couple of uh, important issues. I want to ask you about those. We'll talk issues with Drew Curtis. He's an independent candidate for governor on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers in just a bit. Six o'clock this evening, it's the major party candidates for governor in an interview, a debate, live from EKU. Back in a moment. Welcome back in. We're glad to have you along here on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers ahead of this evening's debate at Eastern Kentucky University when Republican Matt Bevin and Democrat Jack Conway will be on stage and they will be uh, interviewed uh, by uh, WLKY and WKYT. The League of Women Voters uh, is sponsoring that. Now, the candidate who will not be there is Independent Drew Curtis and he is with us now. And we wanted to give you uh, that opportunity to, to be heard. Um, as you know, it was uh, the League in this case and uh, there have been some other cases where other organizations that organized the debates right. had criteria that uh, did not allow you in. Right. And you're all right with that. As well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of how it goes. Uh, I don't think that those criteria benefit us as a society, unfortunately. But, you know, it's one of those deals where uh, the aggravation that I have is not with the media partners because I get the impression that they would rather have me there. Let's go to the issues. We have uh, the pension hammer hanging yes. over our heads. Uh, teachers and state workers have completed, who have completed their careers uh, are due... Uh, a check, uh, mm -hmm. a, re a, a retirement for the rest of their lives, but state government has come up short in meeting its obligations to fund those. Those employees paid their portion over mm -hmm. the years, uh, but there's an unfunded liability now estimated at $30 billion or so. Does Kentucky cut other programs to fund it? Do we borrow money to, uh, to make it up? What do we do? Yeah, so I took a look at this problem because as somebody who's not a policy guy, I was like, you know, what are the biggest problems facing the state? And I found this pretty early on, and I was I, I just, it was unbelievable. It didn't, like, I was like, this, the pension system, is the biggest problem facing us? But it is. And not only is it the biggest problem, it's to the point where I don't understand why these two guys want to get elected to run right into this thing, because this is the end of somebody's political career if they hit this without knowing how to solve it. So the problem is, is that starting around 2001, we quit paying money into the system at the legislative level, and they let it go on so long that now the fund can't keep itself afloat. So I have a solution out there that's sort of unusual. It requires a little bit of debt financing, but we've already racked up $30 billion. It's basically refinancing $5 billion of that debt, so this isn't new debt, and then basically drawing that down as necessary to allow the fund to grow back over the period of 20 years. So you borrow $5 billion. Right. Well, sort of. You actually you carve it out and you have like a credit card, basically, and you tap it as necessary. Because we might get lucky and invest well, and then if this thing earns enough money, then over time we should be okay. But we're also going to hit a 
recession sometimes in the next two or three years. And in fact, probably when uh, Illinois' pension system bankrupts that state, I think it'll, it'll take us out next. So we need to find a way to be able to float over these downtimes. And the idea is that if you borrow money, you lose on the interest. The interest is just gone. So rather than taking it all out at once and paying interest in instantly, use a credit card instead and draw it down as necessary to keep the interest payments very low. Mr. Curtis, there's also frustration from many who are in the system who feel there's not enough transparency. They don't know where that money mm -hmm. is being invested. They fear that it is going into uh, black holes in yeah. some cases. Uh, would you want to address that as well? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I would throw the doors open to the media to go in there and see what's exactly going on. The, the problem is this, is like, so they claim there's no corruption going on over there. Uh, I'll take your word for it, but if there isn't, then we let some journalists in there. That ought to be okay, right? I mean, so let's just go and see what's going on, because actually I see a lot of sketchy stuff over there. It isn't just mismanagement that caused this problem, though, but that's a big part of it as well. Uh, it would be really good to take care of that also, as well as shoring up the finances on the other side. As you have listened to the major party candidates uh, out there, and you've been, as we said, to uh, other debates where they have been, uh, have you moved any closer to either of their positions on such issues as uh, early childhood education? Jack Conway wants to increase funding for uh, early childhood education. Uh, Matt Bevan uh, talks about offering more educational opportunities, uh, such things as charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, embrace either of their stands? Are you closer to one or the other? or what? Um, Well, like most things, it's nuanced. So I, I do agree with Jack Conway that early childhood education is important. But we're in a situation right now where we can't find the money to do it. So my recommendation on there was let's hold off at least a couple of years and get some of these other bigger issues taken care of. On charter schools, though, uh, I have an interesting nuance on this one. So the big push for that is coming from West Louisville. And West Louisville has an education system. 20 of the 29 worst performing schools in the state are in West Louisville. And so they've essentially been abandoned by their educational system. And they're requesting the option to create charter schools specifically just there. I don't think I got a problem with that. And the reason why is because now charter schools do have issues. Uh, charter schools destroyed the school systems in California. They destroyed them in Louisiana. There's no doubt. But that doesn't mean there is not an implementation that might not destroy the public school. And provided that we could be really smart about it and come up with one of those, I don't see why not experimenting in West Louisville, an area of the state that has no good functioning educational system, why not give it a shot? Maybe we could actually find that implementation that both accomplishes all the goals that charter schools want and also accomplishes all the goals that the public school system wants as well. There's probably a way. So let's work on that. A lot of young Kentuckians are investing a lot in college educations, in, in higher ed. They're told that if you get a degree, you will earn more money. And yet some of them are going into life with a heavy debt. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they have difficulty then finding jobs because they haven't trained in the areas where the jobs are available. Available. How would you uh, get at that issue? Yeah, I have great sympathy for this problem because I went to a small liberal arts school and relative to my peers racked up a significant amount of debt in the process. And that really set me behind the curve when I was in my 20s because I'm spending a significant portion of my income just on debt service. And this is now what we've done to almost everybody coming out of college. I, I don't have a solution for that right now. Again, it's because the money is tight, but it is the case that tuition is rising because higher education is not being funded at the level that it always was. But unfortunately, that ends up taking something like fourth or fifth priority behind essentially pensions, tax reform, and job creation, uh, and then upgrading technological systems across the state. And so, like, that is very important, but I, I call it the fifth apocalypse. It's the, uh, that's the next one we'll get to once we clear the rest of them out. The gasoline cas uh, gas tax has dropped by 20.6%, another major mm -hmm. issue in September. It's tied to the price of gasoline, which has uh, been going down, as you know. Meanwhile, automobiles are becoming more and more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, some automakers are talking about doing away with a gasoline engine in the not so distant future. But as our bridges are over trafficked and some are becoming obsolete and we have repair needs for the highways and streets, uh, what do you do about that money that is drastically shrinking? Yeah, so one of the ways to handle the gas taxes is that right now it's basically it's X cents per gallon. Well, why don't we make that a percentage? So that way, if the price of gas rises or falls, we basically float up or down based on how that goes. But the, the greater problem we've got is that, so I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and I'd say probably one in 10 cars out there are electric. So how do you pay for roads if you start having vehicles that don't use gas? So we do have to come up with another solution for that. We have a few years on it. But uh, and some of the solutions that have been tried as a road use tax, uh, but the upshot is we have to overhaul that entire system because of the, the, the society is changing. Technology is changing. And uh, if we don't, you know, and, and my point is this, it's like, so nobody likes tax, but how much do you like good roads? 
and then you tell me where your 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 uh, where your threshold is, and we'll you figure it out. You made a point in the uh, debate in Louisville that uh, we you, we may be uh, in the position of having to legislate how to regulate uh, driverless cars right, in the not too uh, distant future. Uh, do you think that state government needs to be looking ahead, looking around the corner at what uh, may be just around the, around the bend? Yeah, in fact, if anything, this is the thing government does the worst. Nobody's looking ahead, and uh, partially because politicians don't understand technology, and partially because they don't know how to anticipate trends. And in particular, the driverless car thing, I've mentioned it a couple of times. I know the guy who's the head of the driverless car program at Google, and he says we're four and a half years away. In fact, he was on 60 Minutes about three weeks ago. Four and a half years away before this actually hits the road. So first of all, our laws need to be updated. We need to say instead of having the driver needs to pull over, it needs to say the car needs to pull over because driverless cars don't have drivers. So we need to overhaul that section of the law. On top of that, we have everybody who drives for a living is going to be out of a job all at the same time. Now, that's bad, but the good news is we do have four and a half years to plan for this. Like, we actually could put programs in place proactively to anticipate that day because we do will know the day as we get closer to when this is happening. And so we can avoid this, all these people being thrown out of work simultaneously. And, you know, the fact that government doesn't look ahead is probably one of the greatest problems we face. Is there a future for Kentucky coal? There is, but it's going to be as a part of a larger conversation. Right now, the problem with coal is, is that natural gas is super cheap. Uh, a problem they're going to have in the future is that eventually solar is going to be price competitive as well. And so you, whether you like coal or you don't, the economics of the situation are what actually is going to decide how things work. So I would say the nice thing about coal is, is that it can stay in the ground and we can go get it later if we need to. It's a good sort of backup plan. Uh, what we really need is a diversified energy economy that doesn't just rely on one single thing. And I, I would like to help coal companies work on that if possible. If you were governor of the Commonwealth and you were handed a death warrant, would you likely sign it? Absolutely not. Uh, no. Uh, the problem with the death penalty is, uh, aside from where I'm at on that personally, I think it's actually it's, uh, more of a punishment to allow people to live forever. Uh, which sounds kind of strange, but I mean, would you rather be bored or would you rather wink out? The other problem is there is, there is extra damage inflicted upon the people who have to do this for a living. The people who have to, there are human beings that must execute this person. It isn't the governor that does it. And that's unfair to ask them as well, and it doesn't solve any of the problems that were created in the first place. Drew Curtis is with us, independent candidate for governor. We're back with our final questions for him coming up at 6 o'clock tonight. It's the debate from EKU, the major party candidates for governor, and they will be taking the stage there again 6 o'clock this evening evening on WKYT. Stay with us now for more. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We're ahead of this evening's debate that will be at Eastern Kentucky University this evening, and that's when the Republican Matt Bevan and Democrat Jack Conway will be on stage. It'll be broadcast by WKYT in Lexington, WLKY in Louisville, and the League of Women Voters acting as the sponsor of that. We're with Drew Curtis right now, the independent candidate uh, for governor. Uh, Mr. Curtis, uh, if you were confronted with a crisis such as a natural disaster, as Governor Steve Bashir has had to deal with over and over in his term from things like tornadoes and mm -hmm. ice storms and wind storms. Are you prepared to handle that? Yeah, uh, because basically that's sort of what government does is step in in the face of a disaster like that. Um, and possibly in ways that you wouldn't think so. So, for example, I'm a technology guy, and uh, I had a friend of mine who actually worked for FEMA at one point on a natural disaster that I think was in the state. And one of the ways they wrote identify problem areas was is to try to figure out where calls were not coming from. Because if you think about it, that means that there's probably lines that are down, and you might want to identify those areas. So it isn't just the calls for help you're getting specifically, but it's the ones you're not getting that matter as well. So absolutely, uh, I would be totally ready for that. Heather Curtis has been your partner in life and in business and in this race. Ha has she enjoyed what has been going on th out there on the campaign trail? I think you've made uh, some uh, hints that you think she may have become more interested in politics than you are. Yeah, she actually told me the other day that she thinks she's found her calling, which was interesting. But, you know, the way she put it was is that, you know, she says, I read all these things all the time about problems, policies, and solutions and whatnot, and all of a sudden to be possibly in a position to execute some of these solutions, like, you know, that's what needs to happen. We need normal people stepping up and grabbing the reins on this thing and taking control of it. You have uh, operated worldwide with FARC.com and have kind of always had that perspective, as you've mentioned here several times, a technology perspective. But what have you learned about Kentucky during this race uh, in terms of it being both urban and rural and mountainous and 
flat and uh, more well-to-do and, and poor in some areas. Yeah, it is amazing the diversity of geographic areas we have. I mean, we have an inner city, Louisville, that's almost as large as the entire city of Lexington. We've got, you know, rural eastern Kentucky, which is mountainous. We have rural western Kentucky, which is less so. The one thing that actually fascinated me more than anything else was finding how ready people are for technology. Like, they get it. They want broadband networks. They want to learn how to code. They are ready to be upgraded. And to me, I would have thought that might take some convincing, but it turns out everybody's there already. So now that we've got that in play, that is great, because if we could actually roll some of these things out to the rest of the state, they would take it and run with it. How have you liked the things like, uh, you know, the barbecues, the, 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 the picnics, the, you know, those kinds of events that uh, I, I know you've been to. Have you enjoyed mm -hmm. those? I have been ruined for store-bought desserts forever. <laughs> I have had nothing but homemade cakes and uh, cookies for the past, like, six months. The food is absolutely outstanding. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I'm just glad I didn't end up gaining 50 pounds in the process because that, that was, it was easily could have happened. Many have uh, been impressed with your unconventional thinking in this campaign. Would you do this again? And did you aim too high? Would you consider seeking another possibly more attainable office? Yeah, uh, so would I do this again? I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, like, I, my reaction is, yeah, maybe. But I also know myself, and I get distracted pretty easy, and it's going to be another four years between now and then. And so, you know, I'm not really sure what I'll be doing three years from now to you know, see if that makes any sense. Uh, one thing I would probably do differently is I would find a uh, get an infrastructure going earlier than uh, I did this time around. I was thinking that you wouldn't necessarily need that as much, but it turns out I was completely wrong about that. Um, but, yeah, I, I had a good time. As far as, like, um, other offices, though, the problem I have is that uh, being a legislator or something similar to that doesn't interest me so much. I don't have laws that I would like to write. Voting on them is not particularly exciting to me. The executive to me is interesting because that's where you can actually solve problems. And so that's the thing I would like to do. Drew Curtis, uh, independent candidate for governor, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers. Don't forget the gubernatorial debate from EKU is coming up at 6 o'clock here on WKYT, and we hope you can join us then and have a good week ahead.